First of all, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the unceded sovereignty of all Aboriginal nations and lands we're speaking on today. I'd like to acknowledge my elders past and present and the elders of all peoples on this country. I'd like to acknowledge um, our ancestors. I'm actually speaking from Durrumbul country up here in Rockhampton, central Queensland, which is my own ancestral country. Um, and I'm a Durrumbul and South Sea Islander woman um, and a journalist who focuses uh, largely on justice issues um, and feminism and cultural heritage um, and a whole host of other issues. Um, I'm really excited to be chairing this really important event, which is the second in the Wheeler Centre's series, Broadly Speaking, and it's supported by Christina Campbell, Pretty AM um, and Family. Um, it's also being streamed on the lands of the Kulin Nation today, um, and we're all speaking from uh, Aboriginal nations today. Um, this conversation follows the first broadly speaking event, which marks the 20th anniversary of Eileen Morden Robinson, distinguished professor, I should say, Eileen Morden Robinson, um, her groundbreaking work, uh, Talking Up to the White Woman. Um, Professor Morden Robinson is one of our most foremost public intellectuals. She's a world renowned scholar and Goenpool woman whose work has been incredibly influential to a generation of Aboriginal scholars, both here and internationally, and particularly I'm indebted to her work um, because it's informed everything um, that I write uh, currently. Um, Professor Morden Robinson work, Robinson's work foregrounds Indigenous sovereignty and exposes the colonial logics of white possession that operate through all of our institutions and other foundation for the invasion and the theft of this country. Um, so we have a really preeminent panel um, coming us from overseas and even in our own borders today. Um, and I really wanted to open up the opportunity for our panellists to actually introduce um, themselves and their work and maybe um, uh, the lands that they're speaking on today. Um, so maybe I'll start with you, Lauren. Would you like to introduce yourself? My name is Lauren Michelle Jackson, and I'm a assistant professor of English at Northwestern University. I'm also the author of the essay collection, White Negroes, um, which is about cultural appropriation. Um, I currently live here in Chicago on occupied lands formerly, um, in which you know the Potawatomi people formerly resided. Thank you so much. Tanya, would you like to go next? Buzu Anin Wachea, Tanya Talaga Nigis Nikas. Hi, my name is Tanya, and I am speaking to you from Takaranto, which is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit and the home of the Haudenosaunee and Wendat people. Um, I am a journalist, I'm an author, I've written two books, one of which has just come out in Australia, I came out, um, I think it was in January, called All Our Relations, and the book looks at Indigenous trauma in the time of colonialism, and I look at a number of different countries, and so that's who I am. I am uh, an Ojibwe woman. My mother was is Ojibwe and my father was Polish. So I'm of mixed race. Thank you so much. Niodol, would you like to go next? Um sorry, I'm a bit distracted today. As always, we wake up with another racist stuff going on in some form of this. I just really mean it. Sorry, I've, I've got to be distracted. There was uh, some um, Something that I found uh, really offensive, considering that there was a group of people that were in really severe lockdown, predominantly people of color and migrants. And, you know, we have a politician who was trying to, in addition to calling them drug addicts and alcoholic, trying to bed down on that by sending them, by insisting that Australian poll, uh, Australian Post send them, you know, messaging, messages of her digging down on that and saying, you know, along the line that I'm saying what none of you, you know, what you're thinking and something not personal. So that's a bit worked me up <laughs> because it's just another space where you feel like you can't, you kind of almost not step into a day without having to clearly want to step aside racism just to focus on on work and, and, and this. So in terms of introduction, um, I'm Nyadu Nguyen and I work as a lawyer and um, I do predominantly uh, public interest uh, 
practice and um, which is to work with charities and non-profit organizations on a permanently pro bono basis. Um, and outside of that, I, I write sometimes and, um, and, and do some advocacy on areas of interest, in, including the impacts of racism and discrimination. Thank you so much for that. And I actually saw that article today and I think you're right. The racism in this country and I think all across the world is so draining um, and it can be a distraction. Maybe I should start with you and just ask how do you uh, deal with that? Because uh, the sad thing I think is that we just have such low representation um, of African women, particularly in the Australian media. And so I feel you have to take a lot of the heat for that being such a prolific figure. So how do you deal with um, that issue of racism or just this continual distraction that's also impacting on your own personal life? Uh, I don't know. Um, it is really exhausting and it's um, it, it takes your mind and your focus away from just doing things. You know, I was lucky to, to, to get an offer to write a book and you, I, sometimes you can't focus on that because you can't just bring your mind to get to a level of, of calmness and attention that you want to draw to it because there's just so much happening. And and the other thing is that I, I feel that in Australia and a lot because of the the entrenched denial of what has been done to Indigenous people, that people refuse to talk about race. And so the conversations are just extremely shallow. Um, take this incident where Pauline Hansen um, well-known racist political figure elected on, predominantly on a racist platform um, and uh, call a group of people that are in severe lockdown, um, drunkard alcoholics who cannot speak English, and, and then demand that Australia Post then send, send uh, you know, content that is essentially harassing these people and belittling them and you know demeaning them further by saying you know no hard feelings and and I'm saying what and one thinks and then you then have a group of people within within this space within spaces of power saying that this is legitimate use of 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 the Australian post service because this is political content you know it's not political content it's racist trolling it's it's her using um cleverly knowing um, how to use legitimate means to get in her racist messaging and bullying. And people, and because people haven't experienced racism or do not know what racism feels like, to them it's just political content because it can never be anything else. It's just offensive political content where, in fact, it's her using um, this means to actually harass and demean because nothing in what she said is political vision or political commentary or political position. It's just essentially just trolling. It's just being done by a public figure. And so you find yourself in this space where you're trying to have conversations with people about really basic concepts. And you're thinking this is also exhausting because it, it means that it, it almost makes you feel as if this is useless because it means that we haven't even got to where we should be getting. This is not the conversations we should be having. Like if it's this, like if you cannot even figure out what this thing is, my God, like how far are we off from the mark? And it, so, so anyway, yeah, so, but it does come, you know, it comes as a, a personal cost. And every time, you know, you, you have to pay and you're aware of that you're paying for it personally, you, you do think about whether it's time to step out. Like I haven't, I've, I've taken a month away from work because um, I was trolled again where I had a fur ride activists make a video about me and share it on his platform. And, and I just got, they just struck me down on all my platforms and started harassing me for days uh, on end. And when that comes in addition to being in a lockdown, looking after your children, trying to work and all that, it just becomes, you know, that additional thing that makes you feel like okay, it, it's now hard to sort of balance everything. So, um, and, and I think in terms of the trajectory, my own progress. I think you know. Sometimes I do feel that it affected. You know, you hear comments of that people thinks you are uh, um, you you might be hard to deal with uh, because you because I don't necessarily put everything out as diplomatically as I know that I'm expected to do so. And so I think part of it is that you're not uh, politically you no know, you're not diplomatic enough, and you wonder what sort of other avenues this prevents you from accessing because people, because you're willing to have difficult conversation, 
people then perceive you as a difficult person. I I just want to pick up something you said. It's about, you know, the fact we've been talking, I mean, Black and Indigenous women and women of colour have been talking about racism and the impact and the intersections between race and gender and class for a very long time. Um, And yet when racist incidents happen or they're aired in the media, we go back almost to 101. So, Lauren, I mean, I think that was something that you mentioned in your piece. What are the functions of these trying to educate um, white people when we want to move on? You know, not move on, but we want to have these very sophisticated conversations, but they want to go back to the start. Are they actually doing the work or is it about centering almost their own um, innocence, I would say, or wanting they want to be seen to be doing something but not actually want to do things like give up power and give up privilege? I think it's, I mean, I think it's all those things, right? Um, I, I think, so for me, it was, I think really it's like the repetition of it was just so striking. Um, so I really kind of like honed in on these, these reading lists, um, in the U.S. following um, the police murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis, Minnesota, I just noticed like this onslaught of, and I'm, I'm like very online, you know, the following, like all the, you know, the New York Times, all, all those publications, and you just see like almost on command, it's like everyone has their like, these are the 13 books you need to read, the 15 books you need to read, the 10 books you need to read. And it's like, you would think, you know, if these are being write it or written by um, like different mastheads or being written by different writers and different scholars and authors, um, like obviously the canon is the canon, but you would think, especially for something as broad as quote unquote uh, anti-racism, which is still a term that I am a little bit uncomfortable with because I'm not really sure what the function of, not really sure what the function of that term is, but you would think there'd be a little bit of variation. Like if I make a list, and you make a list, like we might have some overlap, but we also probably will have like very different texts. But among these lists, I just noticed it was almost entire, you know, entirely overlap. And it, it's and it's kind of like the same thing where if you went back and looked um, in like 2014 or 2013 um, after the deaths of Michael Brown, after the death of Trayvon Martin, like it's like you would see the same list with the same text on it. And they're great texts, of course, like Audre Lorde. Yes, read Audre Lorde, read Angela Davis, read James Baldwin. Um, absolutely. But you would think, like, <laughs> if we were actually reading these people um, and not just when there's a, a a moment of eruption at, like, the national level, but if we were actually reading these people in our schools and in our education, right, it's like, well, first of all, we'd have we'd be rereading them, but then we'd also be engaging with their interlocutors, engaging with contemporary writers and thinkers who are, you know, building off their work. We'd be working with authors and writers who have been whose work has been uncovered since then, right? People are always finding new work in the archive and new perspectives. And we would be thinking of that if we didn't always have to be pulled back to this place of of 101, as you said. And so it does kind of feel like the list, the function of the list is to is to feel good about reading the list itself and not necessarily uh, reading and thinking with the actual, the actual texts and thinkers that appear on it. Yeah. And I think it really obscures um, their own complicity and what is happening. They can sort of say, oh, you know, I've read this book or I'm going to read this book but I'm actually not going to engage um, or actually look for the real, you know, people are calling, um, African-American communities are calling for justice, but can you get justice from just saying, oh, no, I've read this and I've engaged in this, but I'm not going to give up my my power or any of the um, factors that have historically led to this that have entrenched my own privilege and have entrenched your own disadvantage. Absolutely. And it completely obscures the fact that like reading takes time. (laughs) It takes like a lot of time. Like if people are out in the streets, it's like, no, like it's kind of like, no, now is actually not the time for you to like sit and patiently read this like 
300 word tome. Like the time for you to read that was like years ago or like months ago or decades ago, right? Like people are calling for action and change. And so it is a little bit like narcissistic to be like, oh, I'm so late to this cause. Like, let me like sequester myself with my book and like figure out what's going on here. Um, and Tanya, I've noticed, I mean, when I've read some of these anti-racist reading lists, there is still an erasure of Indigenous voices and in Indigenous writing particularly. Um, and when I was reading one of your essays about the seven fallen feathers, it struck me, as it always does, um, there's so many commonalities with Australia, but there's differences as well. But I really loved how you really centred um, the humanity of the children and the families and also foregrounded the historical circumstance that had led to this. Um, what role do you see yourself as an Indigenous writer and a journalist and how does it differ from um, mainstream um, media, particularly when you're looking at what I see and we have it over in here Australia, is almost a silencing of Indigenous voices and almost an erasure of Indigenous perspectives? Mm -hmm. Thanks for that question. Um, well, I have sort of been in and out of the mainstream, mostly in the mainstream media um, since 1995. And um, for 20 years, I worked at the Toronto Star, which is uh, one of the biggest newspapers here in Canada. And I have to tell you, there was never a hunger or a want or a desire uh, for Indigenous news. And if there was, it was always kind of the same story, you know, oh, you know, are you, my editors would say, are you coming to me with stories about uh, chiefs that, you know, have been ripping off communities, or um, is this a story of uh, uh, more, honestly, more drunken Indians? Um, the level of racism that runs through um Canada and has run through Canada um, towards Indigenous people is very quiet, but it's always present. And it's been there for such a long period of time. And I would say that it's the exact same in the United States and in Australia. It's, um, you know, it's, it's hidden, it's there, but and then sometimes it's in your face. You know, um, we, um, we have to fight to get our voices heard. Um, you know, I'm one of only, um, to be quite honest with you, I, I now work at the Globe and Mail. Um, I just started uh, a column there this month. And I'm the only female Indigenous columnist in the entire country at a newspaper. Um, there's a, a man and his name is um, uh, Negan Sinclair. He's at the Winnipeg Free Press. But we are the only two. Um, you know, people haven't cared. They haven't cared for so long. And they've always thought that we're uh, the government's problem, you know, that um, we're different from everyone else. And, you know, and that's, oh, that's a quote unquote Indian problem. That's not my problem when they see our incarceration rates, um, which are incredibly high throughout, uh, throughout Canada. Um, or when they see um, our uh, mental health issues and our homeless issues of many Indigenous people, you know. Um, and I, you know, getting back to what you were talking about with Lauren uh, and the lists, um, I blame um, education actually for a large part of this um, because the true history of the of Turtle Island of North America, the true history of Australia, has not been taught, you know, because countries have not lived up to what they've done in history. Um, you know, I'm sure the, um, the kids in the United States are not learning about the extermination policies of the United States government towards indigenous people and the, the trail of tears with the Cherokee. Right. And as the same in Canada, we do not learn of residential schools. We have historically not learned of the fact that since the mid 1800s to 1996, 150,000 of our children were taken away from their parents their homes, their culture, everything that they know, their language. And they were taught to be good British citizens. And these schools were federally funded and run by the Christian churches. Um, and they were essentially there to beat the Indian out of the child. That was a quote from one of our founders, Sir John A. MacDonald. Um, you know, we, 
we have a very, very hard history here in North America, and it's been erased and ignored. And until we get that back on the curriculum, get the truth back on the curriculum, we're constantly going to be reading James Baldwin, you know, going back to that same list. We're not going to be looking at new voices. And these are voices that need to be heard. You know, I was just uh, reading, rereading James Baldwin on the weekend um, because there's so many similarities that I see with uh, there's an intersectionality between Black and Indigenous st struggles and our history because North America was a continent born on violence. And that is not taught, and it needs to be. Um, and it's interesting in Australia because we've always had a unique situation where we were Black and Indigenous. And so we had those two sort of um, functions coming together, which I think is a bit different um, from Canada and Australia. But I think what you said about history is something that is very unique to Black and Indigenous women writers because even, Lauren, I picked it up when I was reading some of your your book, you you have a very solid analysis of cultural appropriation um, and pop culture, but you are always going back to the archive and you are always going back to history. Um, why is that so important or how is that important and do you see that as a part of um, Black women's writing particularly? I really appreciate you saying that because I I don't think of myself as a very good historian, <laughs> I think. I just think like a lot of, I think, huh? no, 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 no. I just, um, I, I don't know. I, you know, I'm a literary critic by training. So like, I love looking at, uh, I love looking at literature and, and reading the text. Um, but I think like some of the, the things that historians and the people responsible for writing history have done has just been like, so it's just like, you know, it's just, I'm just like, ugh. You know, I don't want to adopt that. But I think part of part of me, for me, I think part of going to the archive or my version of the archive has to do with looking up to writers and scholars, many of them other Black women who are just feel a sense of responsibility about like making sure they get the citation right and making sure they give credit where where credit is due. And I mean, in a book about appropriation, which is a book about, you know, all the people who don't get to receive credit either uh, culturally or aesthetically or monetarily, financially, economically for the, the creative, um, their creative pursuits, right? Like I, I definitely was not going to <laughs> try to cut quarters on um, really making sure the the sort of historical trajectory of what I'm talking about, even within like a limited frame, uh, most of the book is pretty concentrated on um, the the new millennium and, and social media and things like that. But I, I just really wanted to get that right because I just think it's so, it's so irresponsible to act like your approach, you know, your realization of something or discovery of something, right? To use like a very charged word um, that your discovery of something is like the first time anyone has like apprehended, you know, this thing, whether it's like literally land or, a, you know, a certain perspective on like an artwork or a way to braid hair or something like that. All of these things, I think, uh, just really come with such a like a colonial mindset in, in a capitalist framework. And so I think for me, part of citation is trying to trying to work against that trying to be the not single author of a single authored work right to say that like I didn't do this alone I had to think with all these people and these are all those people even the ones who I might not fully disagree with like these are all the people that I needed to write about this thing and so I'm just always thinking about that whether it's in my scholarly work whether it's in a magazine um, I just think citation and credit and bibliography and all that stuff that seems so dry when you're learning about it um, as a student are just like really, really important. I was just going to say it is a very white thing to claim discovery of something. And I think that was something that's in Professor Eileen Morden Robinson's work, which this discussion sort of follows is about the white possessive and how uh, white settler colonial societies have tried to 
uh, possess even Indigenous identity as a way to take land. And so I think, um, yeah, I was really um, amazed because I think sometimes we look over to Canada, for example, and say, well, they're so far ahead of us. But I was really amazed to hear that you only have one. You're the only Indigenous woman columnist. That is amazing that people still think it's okay to have uh, non-Indigenous writers predominantly writing stories and interpreting our issues for us. I mean, it's amazing that in this, um, because we have the same same situation here in Australia. So I'm never shocked when it's happening in Australia, but I always think, oh, it must be different overseas. And yet there's that similarity in settler colonial stories as if they don't want to let us tell our own stories, I guess, Tanya. Yeah, it's, I think it's persistent across, uh, you know, across Turtle Island, Australia, for sure. I mean, you could look south of the border too. Um, I could name two uh, Native American journalists that I know, um, Julian Brave Noisecat and Jenny Monet. Um, and they work, you know, so hard to do what they're doing. Um, and, you know, the U.S. has Indian Country Today, which is an amazing um, uh, news, digital news organization, organization as well. But it's a struggle, you know, it's a struggle. Um we make up about 4% of the population of Canada. Um, and if you were to walk into our newsrooms, you wouldn't see us at all. You know, it's, um, we're in the process now of really trying to change that, you know, lots of programs have started, but to change people's minds is an, is something new and it's something different, right? I mean, we have to go beyond to just having reporters and editors. We have to be in positions of decision-making. We have to be the executive editors. We have to be the ones on the boards making decisions, you know, and that's been true for women for a long time, but it's particularly true for BIPOC women, you know, um, just having a white woman as the board chair or, you know, the um, editor of a newspaper, it's not the same, <laughs> you know, at all. At all. Um, and so that's where we are at now. I think people are realizing that. And there's been a lot of, you know, since uh, George Floyd, since he passed away, since he was murdered, there's been a lot of introspection happening. And I'm glad to say that Black and Indigenous are sort of joining hands and saying, you know, well, we have to push through together because we'll make our voices stronger that way. That's um, how it's been for us here anyway. And I've sort of seen that in Australia as well. Um, Neodol, after the Black Lives Matter um, movement, uh, after the recent death of George Floyd, we also had in Australia, um, finally Australians seem to wake up and we have this situation where they only seem to care when it happens overseas. And so we spent a lot of time talking and writing um, and saying, well, actually, this is happening over here in different forms. You know, we have a lot of Aboriginal people dying in custody. Um, New Adult, you know, we have the slandering of African youth in the newspaper, which has severe um, consequences on the lived realities of African youth and um, the African community in Australia. Um, New Adult, how do you see, I mean, I think it. we were always worried that that momentum in Australia would fall away. Do you see that happening Um from the historic protests that we that we did have, how do you see that that momentum going now? Um, I think as always, it fall back on the people that are closer to the pain eventually to keep pushing for change. And in 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 that much, like you see people release. Um, you know, a statement about Black Lives Matters. And then I think there was even some media platforms that did so, but then they'll continue to then host all white panels or invite the likes of Pauline Hanson. <laughs> you know, this is what I'm talking about, Black Lives Matters. And they're also doing things that undermine that, you know, because it's not just a statement of you know, supporting Black people and, in, you know, First Nation people is what are you doing structurally within your organization to make sure that the change is permanent? Are you employing people from that area? Are you changing your government's structures so that there's far more representation in it? Are you um, getting in front of the conversation and not just having the conversations? Because Black Lives Movement has sort of pushed the conversation 
far, and now people are far more com comfortable to say the statement. But before, you couldn't even say that without it seeming as if it was an extremely polarizing statement, right? So now is that's the comfort level. Like, are you willing to step beyond that and say more? You know, are you willing to uh, use your credibility and your legitimacy and your money to actually implement change? And if you look at that, I don't think things has changed a lot since the movement, you know? And I think that's where you realize that only those who truly have something to, to, to lose and who have always been losing are the ones that continue to show up and show up no matter how exhausted they are. Um, and people would sort of fall back into their, into their comfort level again. Like Australia is really interesting. I, I normally think that it's not my position to ever say that this country is a racist country because I think that you know, that's something for Indigenous people to say. Like, I've been here for 12 years or you know, more than a decade, and my experience can never take account of the dispossession and displacement and genocide. So it's, you know, I don't say that, but you sit and watch, you know, members of parliament, federal parliament, like even coming up, they're going to get into a conference with, um, you know, a far-right figure that was um, was using the same ideology that you know the white supremacist who killed fifty one people in New Zealand had in her had in his uh, uh, what is it called his manifesto. And you're having federal politicians going and sharing a platform with someone who supported and sort of advocated for the kind of what could be called the radicalizing materials that someone used to massacre 51 people. And you really ask yourself, like, am I, like, how safe are black, black and brown and First Nation people if, you know, members of parliament can have the freedom in this country to engage in that? Imagine this happening in any context. Imagine a brown or black boy of Muslim faith, you know, going and presenting with someone who exposed extreme ideology. Like there would be front page newspaper. They would be hounded out of this country. And yet we have members of parliament. Like I, I can't conceptualize how that's permissible in a country that calls itself one of the most multicultural societies in the world. You know, so it is living in this, in this sort of, in this space where, Yes, you know, there are a group of people pushing for change and, and diversity and more inclusion, but the reality, the institutions are extremely stuck in this country. They're just stuck in their ways. They're just repeating the same things and they're not ready for change. And when you push too far, they have the power to make you the problem. You know, it is your victim mentality. It is your um, laziness um, that is not making things improve. And, and it, it, they make the communities then become the problems. And that, of course, is just a rotation of exactly what people are trying to, to, to change. And, I mean, my, part of my trolling came because of what I say du during the Q&A session on Black Lives Matter, um, because, I, I, you know, because of the statement I made in it. And I think that was the discomfort that caused people, you know, the, 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 the sort of trolling. Yeah. Um, and I think like just thinking of who benefits from those racist attacks, for example, the politicians that New Dollar is talking about, um, you know, they're in the Senate, they have a political party, they've, she's constantly benefited and actually made money um, from racist attacks. And I, I think that speaks to a lot of your work, Lauren, around who profits. Um, and I think it all comes, it comes back to um, the devaluation of um, our lives as uh, black and indigenous people. I think that's where the lack of care comes. I think there's still a fundamental failure to even see us as human. Um, and so I think that's where uh, the real importance of black and indigenous writing and other women of color writing comes in. It's about resistance and asserting um, that humanity and that we are human and that we are worthy of justice um, and of coverage. But I think I think what was important in the work that I read of yours, Lauren, was um, just, you know, who is profiting and who is taking and who is winning um, from the stealing of culture 
um, which is so tied to our lives. And as Tanya would say, as Indigenous peoples, it's tied to our land as well. Um, can you talk a little bit about like profit and power? Um, and I think that that really shows why there's a failure to make change because why would people give that up if they're if they're making what why what would be the impetus for them to give that up you know what I mean right I was actually um going to go back to something that I think was said earlier which is like the the hesitance to right move go forward to push it forward because because there's a there's an idea that um, to to progress would mean to like to lose something and like it's kind of like spoiler alert like yeah like you actually do have to lose something um, and I think that's I think that's where it becomes hard to take the next step uh, with white people in particular. Um, I think that's why like a term like white privilege became so popular and why people seem to like latching on to that because it's the idea that um, privilege is, a, is something that you are born with and something that you have, but it's become this term that's like, oh, you can use your privilege for good. So I'm going to use my privilege to speak out on this thing. And it's like, that's all fine and good. But like to work towards like what we want or what like ought to happen, actually like you would not have privilege at all. Like privilege is not the thing that like, you know, it can be the thing that you use to work towards a better world, but like the version of that better world is you don't have automatic like power that people like other people don't have, right? And so like that seems to be really the sticking point. And to bring it back to, um, thinking about like profit, um, thinking about appropriation. Um, a, a lot of people like will ask me, um, like in response to my book, like, yeah, like what can I do or what would be like the ideal situation? And it's like, yeah, the reason why like the fashion industry can survive the way it is, is because it, it, it exploits, like it like aesthetically exploits, like many, many groups of people and many, many cultures. And it also is just like literally exploiting like the labor of like underemployed or underpaid people just like in abuse people like all around the world, right? Like, and that's not just like the Forever 21s and the Zaras and places like that. That's also like Prada and all the great fashion houses that, you know, we think are someone, you know, some little old Italian lady is like hand stitching this bag in Italy somewhere. It's like, no, like, no, 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 no. Like maybe the final step is when they put in that made in Italy, but like, no, that's like, that's like somewhere in like, like in the Pacific Islands or somewhere they're like exploiting people to like make these bags. And like, that is literally what, you know, that's an expropriation of labor. Right. And so it's like, all these things are what allow just like what we think of as like the most frivolous, uh, like sort of like cultural or mass cultural pursuit, like fashion, clothes or whatever. But it gets like so deep and it's the same thing with food. It's the same thing with coffee culture. Um, it's the same thing in like the the music industry. I think about the American music industry and there's been a lot of reports um, somewhat related to the the film industry thinking about like Me Too and like all of the women whose stories and a lot of them black women whose stories get lost in the sort of history of what made music of like the 90s and hip hop so great. And it's just like all so it's like all of these things. I mean, it just like sounds so awful, but like because it kind of is. Um, and it's like, yeah, improved conditions would mean like toppled monuments, like str like stone monuments, figureheads, like press like leaders. Like it actually means like some people's power that we take for granted, like doesn't get taken for granted anymore. And that's true at the national level, at the local level, at the global level. And so, yeah, when you get to talk about that, that's when like the, 
the sort of like very nice white people start to back away a little bit because then you start to sound really radical. <laughs> and have you noticed that I find, I, I just fa- find that um, retrospectively how even radical people like Martin Luther King is sort of sanitized now because what he says had become more acceptable as like not radical and, and, and assumptions and it create the assumptions as if Martin Luther had overwhelming support when he was, you know, protesting and doing the sitting in, which it wasn't like majority of people didn't support a majority of white people didn't support it. And so now with, you know, the benefit of hindsight, you should be more like Martin Luther King, but actually people are sort of are doing that. It's just radical for the time, just as Martin Luther actions were radical for the time. But with time now, you don't see them as radical. And the same people that are opposing Black Lives Matter now are probably the same people that would have opposed the sit-ins, you know, and the peaceful protests that they that they claim. And it's it's almost as if you're never really winning. It's just const- they're constantly moving the, the line. Um, and so... so and those who continue to suffer I just have to keep pushing because what other alternative do you have? You know, so we don't. Like Black and Brown and First Nation people don't have another alternative but to keep insisting that things change. Otherwise, what is the alternative? That Indigenous people continue to die in custody without one single person in Australia. You know, 400, over 400 people have died in police custody and not a single person has been held accountable. And you, whatever you might be, th- there is a legitimate question how 400 people could die in custody and no one, not even one single person. Like, this is not a political statement. It's just questioning the facts. There has to be something that has gone wrong for them. But to say that is very radical. Like, And it, it, it's, it's a really, it, it's a really hard space to be and I sort of think about is that we live in such different worlds you know like we live in the same country but our day-to-day realities our day-to-day fights what means to us what what even political statement means what we need to be aware of you know so different so for me as a say a black woman I'm quite aware of the rise of far right groups in this country. I'm quite aware of the kind of the development in their language from, you know, outright blunted racism to what how it has morphed into this more sophisticated way of trying to get your message through without being detected. You know, that's of interest to me because that impact my safety and my life here. But of course, it's not something that is alive to predominantly white politicians. And so when they see the statement, it's okay to be white. To them, it's just a statement. You know, it, it doesn't mean any underlining thing. And so in Australia, we had in a federal parliament that statement being supported by a number of politicians because they just thought, you know, it, it, it's crazy. But this is, you know, but if you're a person of color, you know, this developed in, you know, far right white supremacist web spaces and the kind of message behind it. And so we live in different worlds. So to them, it's not a concern. To you, it is a concern. To you, you pay attention to this. And when you try and say, try and talk about it, what is normal to you is so radical to someone, someone else. How are you even going to bridge the gap? Like, if it's radical just to be alive, <laughs> to have, like, the basic need in your political structure to not act in ways that diminish your humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, words matter, right? And um, as a journalist, I get labeled an activist all the time. You know, it's like, oh, you're what you're writing about and um, the angle that you have. Um, you know, I've been called an activist on uh, national radio, um, on you know, in, in news articles when I'm introduced. Uh, it is. I find it fascinating because I'm just telling the truth. I'm reporting the facts. You know, it's like what you just said with 400 people dying, Indigenous people dying um, in incarceration and nobody being held accountable. Um, You report that that's just the truth. That's just the facts. But you get labeled as um, as an activist. I've got to the point where I just think, fine, that's what you want to call me. I don't care. I'm just telling the truth. And this is what is actually happening in our communities, you know. Um, 
And that's like, again, it gets to education and it gets to how I hope one day we're going to figure this out and we're going to change curriculums in our, our public schools and our high schools to teach true history so we don't raise people that have all these biases built in. Because, you know, right now in Canada, we're dealing with generations of lawmakers and politicians, um, judges and lawyers and doctors and nurses and editors that have all grown up thinking that Indigenous people are, you know, something to be ignored and to, to be shunted. And they have all of these problems and we give them everything, you know, um, and we haven't been able to figure out, uh, pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and, and move on. Um, you know, all these prevailing attitudes and notions are still there. And I hope that one day they, they will eventually go away, but it's going to be generational, you know, as Indigenous people, as an Ojibwe woman, we think of seven generations. We think of not us today, but uh, our children and our children's children. And I hope that once we get to future generations, we will get to a more even playing field when it comes to all of these things. And, you know, just uh, something you were talking about too, um, Lauren, um, people are uncomfortable about all of this because it's about sharing power. It's about sharing power, you know, and no one wants to give up power. No one wants to, governments don't want to give up power. They don't want to admit that their parliamentary systems serve only colonial um, functions. They don't want to start everything from the bottom up again, but that's almost like what we need. I know what we need here as First Nations communities is almost like a Marshall Plan, you know? Go back to the treaties, laws of the land, that's, you know, they were signed in good faith and they are legal documents um, and that none of them have been respected. None of them. And the government spends hundreds of millions of dollars every year fighting us in court over land, over power, over the ability for us to make our own decisions. It's remarkable. And the same is very much true here, except that we've never signed a treaty. Um, and I think in Australia, there is a real amnesia um, and myth-making still around the history of this country. Um, and so that's how the, you know, white writers and white witnesses writing about these issues are seen as impartial and unbiased and, and we're perceived as radical just for um, writing about the rights of our people. Like I was reading your article about uh, the seven children in Thunder Bay and because we have very similar rates here of child suicide. Um and just the fact, you know, that should be, that should wake anyone, any person, these, these are children, mm -hmm. out of their complacency. So there's that, you know, it's, it's gone through history, the representations of children and Aboriginal mothers and Aboriginal men that have led to the severe devaluation where people don't even care about the lives of children because that ha we have that similar here. We're very similar mm -hmm. um, child suicide rates and uh, no one seems to care, but it's because of, when you forget about history and when you cover over history, um, you obscure the perpetrator and the violence of that history. And that's how we can have 400 deaths in custody and no perpetrators, as Neodol was saying, how it can be expect mm -hmm. accepted that that mm -hmm. is a reality. Um, because the, the refusal to acknowledge the true mm -hmm. history and only acknowledge the telling of it by white witnesses um, really mm -hmm. uh, obscures what is currently happening and it makes us responsible for the violence that is perpetrated against us, um, including those, you know, seven children. I couldn't, when I was reading your piece, I was just like, how are people not continually outraged? Because that's what happens here where Aboriginal children die because of the racism in health, they die in custody, they die outside custody, um, and just no one seems to care. So that historical perspective, I think, mm -hmm. is so important. And I think it's why Black and Indigenous women's writing is so important. And it's, and it's about resistance. And I, I think it's the most important writing today. And that's why it has been deliberately silenced. Um, yeah, so I don't know if anyone wanted to pick up from those points. But yeah, I just I just feel that's, that's the power of, of the writing in whatever form, poetry, essays, um, TV, when you see Black and Indigenous women's writing, um, it's really resisting those historical representations and forces that real, have real consequences on the lives of particularly our children, um, but every, all members of our communities. Yeah, the education 
Ooh, it's so bad. It's like so bad here. <laughs> and it's in, yeah, you know, I, it's just like, I don't want to be pessimistic, but it like, it really is like getting worse. Um, because all of in, you know, in the U S all of our textbooks are basically made in Texas. And it's like, I don't know, like a handful of companies, maybe even less who are responsible for like the majority of like public school curriculum, like throughout the country. And of course, you know, schools are unevenly funded. So some people have textbooks from like 1995. Some people have textbooks from, you know, 2021 in the future. And like, to an extent, I would almost rather have like the 1995 textbook because that textbook might actually say the word slavery, whereas the recent textbooks have removed the word slavery because racism. And, you know, now we say triangle trade, which is like the most like dastardly euphemism <laughs> of all time. Like, uh, and you, you know, you'll see it on Twitter. People will <laughs> like have, you know, their children will come home with this textbook and they'll just like flip through and they're just like, what is this, you know, describing um, enslaved Africans as like immigrant workers which is also just like a very strange like conflation of um, of sort of like contemporary language and and historical um, phenomena. It's just like, yeah, I mean that, yeah, that is just to say that um, of course when you teach it that way and thinking about, you know, you'll learn, you know, you'll learn the trail of tears as like, that is like a phrase you need to know, or that is like a, a title you need to know. And like, maybe if you paid attention, you'll like, you'll think Andrew Jackson was like really bad, but it's just like, other than that, you know, the, you know, these books will like linger for so long on, um, world, you know, world wars that the U S maybe didn't even participate in for, you know, a while. And then we'll just completely, brush over centuries of slavery and genocide like it was just you know Sunday lunch or something like that it's it's just like it's it's really it's really just wild um and so it's like no wonder students who come to college campuses like come in just like completely you know completely unprepared to even read a novel by by a black person let alone know how to like <laughs> metabolize sort of what is even going on around them, right? As like a product of history. It's just, it's just like really, it's really hard. And in and going back to those lists, it's like, how do you catch someone up who hasn't, has it, you know, is behind by decades of their entire life, right? How do you catch someone up with a single book? And I think one of the things I was really concerned with is like, what you know those books shouldn't have to bear all of that weight and that and that responsibility i mean like james baldwin is a brilliant critic and like yes of course he wrote very affecting essays about racism in america but he was also he, you know he's a writer he's a novelist he's an artist right his work should not be responsible for educating you about like what's going on like he he's passed he's like dead I, I, so I just, you know, I just like also feel very protective about these writers who I think get sort of like flung out into space as like the remedy for, you know, what the American education system is unwilling to talk about. Yeah. I think the fight over history is, is what, even in places like Australia, it's, it's, it's going on and you see what is prioritized as national identity because of what is kind of funded and defended. So indigenous people, or actually maybe I, I prefer the term First Nation people, I, I'm not sure if it's the correct term, uh, but, um, you know, First Nation people in this country have or a significant amount say that we should change 
Australia Day from the 26th when Captain Cook arrived here um, because that's a day that signif signifies the beginning of genocide. And so this is like, this is a really big day in Australia um, where all multicultural communities, so people like me who came to this country as an immigrant, we turn up with our costumes and celebrate this day and join in the national identity of Australia on a day that the first people on this land find to be a day of mourning, a day that marked the beginning of their genocide. And so we just accept that narrative. And, and it takes a while before you realize how you participate in the process of continual colonization of these lands. And you're not even aware of it some of the time. And, but you see how, you know, that day, Australia Day has been celebrated before on so many days, but now all of a sudden there's a group of people that are wedded to this date and do not want to change it. And it just shows why it's just like their priorities that they view this country as predominantly white. They view it as, uh, as, as, and so history must reflect that. And it reflects that through the funding for Captain Cook's monuments and a recreation of his journey, you know, spending millions of dollars on recreating the journey of this man because he signifies something important to a class of people. And then there's the demand that it should signify something important to all of us, even indigenous people, and they should just accept it. And it's like, when people say, oh, we're not going to accept that, then they're seen as hating Australia, they're hating as Australian identity. And it's this huge contest of a history and a group of people assuming that their version of history is, is, is sort of like objective. It's just objective. And it's, you know, when even it's clearly racist in certain sense, it's just objective. And it's, and I think that that then seeps into our books too, as well. Like it's, it's hard to come across books in these countries uh, from, from, from people of color or from First Nation people. And young people are growing up with a dirt of a diversity in their literature. And this, and this then is compounded by lack of diversity in the media, lack of diversity in political systems, and you know, far, far behind than even you know, some other comparable countries um, to Australia. And, and when there is a push, you know, even when there are moments for rupture, that, that opportunity then also get diminished. You know, the, the bringing them home report, which talked about uh, you know, how uh, First Nation children were forcefully removed from their homes. And, and, and it was such an opportunity for the country to truly reflect on this, this particular history. And what happened was that that was completely, that opportunity ended up being missed because you know, certain media organizations, certain politicians started calling it you know, a black armband of history, diminishing the narrative. And what do we end up having? You know, a contest on whether or not children were actually ever removed from their home, despite the fact that there are people alive today who tells this story. And it's, the, it's a complete erasure of people reality. You know, imagine, where do you start when, when even that basic reality, I was stolen from my family. That's the statement someone makes and you're saying, well, no, actually you, you weren't. You were removed for your benefit. <laughs> you know, you were removed for, because your family was negligent. And I think that that would be such a traumatic experience to have and then to be limited by not having the option of where to read and where to, to, to source the information and not have it confirmed in any way. It's, it, it's not surprising that you see the high rates of you know, mental health issue or you see the high rates of suicide. Because it's, it's a complete, what, what happens to people when we deny them their reality? It's, I, very little good come from it, if any. Um, yeah, and I think you uh, said it exactly right. I think they um, they try and pass off this lie that it was for our benefit. So they have this idea of good intentions. And so anything that happened in the bad in in the past, one, it's part of the past, but also the intention was good. And I've even heard that argued by people like Joe Hildebrand around the frontier wars and the genocides and the massacres that happen. Um, that at the time, you know, it was for benefit. And look what we've got now. We've got a first, uh, a developed nation, um, and yet we have, um, like, Aboriginal mob living as second-class citizens in our own country. And so they pass off this lie of in, um, good intentions and um, uh, try and wipe their hands clean. And I think that's one of the strategies um, that they do to deny us our right um, 
to justice and accountability. Um, I'm just conscious of time and we had um, one question come in earlier in the week. Um, so I thought just in closing, uh, maybe we could um, get the panellists to answer that. And it was from Lachlan. Um, and he said, in the era of Trump, issues of racial justice are finally starting to enter the consciousness of white stream society and white people are finally beginning to see the issues that plague our societies. But how do we explain to these new learners that these issues are not new, but it's merely the environment fostering them that has brought them to the fore in this manner? So we've sort of touched on that question a little bit, but I guess um, he's trying to ask um, how do we explain to, to people that actually this is a continuation of these issues um, in a sense. Did anyone want to pick that up or...? Um, I could say right from the, the, the right from the beginning when I hear that it's the fight is still going on. The struggle continues. We have a saying here amongst ourselves uh, that there is much work to be done, and there is much work to be done. You know, we have 61 First Nations communities right now without running clean water in Canada the land of all the freshwater lakes and where everything's supposed to be bountiful and wonderful. We've had um, this past year, since beginning of January, we've had at least eight Indigenous people die in altercations with police. This is something that we live with. This is our reality and there is a lot of work to be done. And what can we do to change things? Um, I think we're getting to a part where we are slowly changing minds. I mean, look at the younger generation, you know, look at people um, like yourselves. Um, I'm getting old, you know, it's but you guys are coming up behind us and you are leading the way and showing the way. And that work sadly continues because uh, we have worked but we have failed you know we're not um we're not anywhere near where we need to be but that's because of all the things we've been talking about since the beginning of this conversation you know the the makeup of colonial institutions and the refusal to give up power the refusal to share um and that's where we need to change minds and hearts and I'm hoping that um, that one day we'll get there, but it's going to be generations and generations. And until then, there is much work to be done. <laughs> That's a, such a good answer. <laughs> Lauren, did I'll, you want to have a go? <laughs> yeah, I, I'll just echo that sentiment. I mean, fortunately, unfortunately, it's an election year here. And something I just keep finding myself saying is that, you know, this is not, and by this, I guess, you know, I think I mean like <laughs> all of it, right? This is not something that like a democratic president is like, this is not over like with the, uh, you know, if Trump is not reelected, like this is not over. It didn't begin with Trump. It doesn't end with the end of Trump. Um, there were, you know, people in cages under Obama. There were people, there were drone strikes, lots of drone strikes under Obama. Actually, police were killing people under Obama. Like, this is not something that you can election away. So um, the positive side of that is, of course, welcome, grab a pickaxe, grab a shovel. Like, let's, <laughs> let's literally get to work. Um, but also like keep, you know, keep your eye on the prize. I feel, I don't know. I feel like a really corny, like peewee baseball coach or something like that, but like stay focused on, on what actually matters. And, and if voting is something that really matters to you, then use your power and privilege to ensure that the people who, whose votes are actively being pre prevented from counting, like get to count, but also listen to people around you and realize that people have been working for a long, long, long time um, and people before them and before them and of course after them and that we all, you know, we all kind of have to like really like dig in and like do something important. Like this is real, this is real life. 
That's brilliant. That was not quite as. Uh... <laughs> no, it was brilliant. <laughs> you have all. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, I, th- I think when you think about how long this has been going on and how many people have fought to progress and improve things, and it can be really sad and I think um, exhausting because you think how 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 more what what more do we need? I think in James Bolden statement, like how long should I wait for your progress? <laughs> you know, uh, and um, but you also realize that people, First Nation people, Black people, Brown and Black people, have fought even far worse than we've had to do. You know, and so it's almost like a duty and respect to turn up, you know, and also do what you can, no matter how painful and exhausting it is. Um, And to know that you come from a history of people that are resilient and and have fought and stood up, you know, and... um, some of those people are alive now, you know, the young lady, I've forgotten her name, who desegregated the school. I think she's turning 66 or something. I think it's Ruby, I've forgotten her last name. And um, and, and so you, you understand that people have, have to be courageous and, 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 and sort of, yeah, and, and bear it. And so for me, when I get really really down and and out, I think that I have no choice but to turn up, you know, um, have a good cry, (laughs) Uh, have a good read if I need to reconfirm, you know, faith and, and, and belief and then get on with it and get on with it. What I have to pay, at least now, is, is far less than people who say paid for their lives. Um, and I truly believe that all movements, um, First Nation movement, African American movement, cont- contribute into the ideas that progress society as a whole, and so their wins is in some way all our win. You know, George Floyd is murdered in the United States, and Indigenous people in this country stand up with solidarity and demand conversation equally around. 400 people who have died in custody. Their conversations become part of our conversation. The changes that emerge from that become a benefit for all of us and even hopefully for our children and the world that our children and their children inherits. Hopefully it's it's a better world. Um, I agree. I don't think that Donald Trump losing an election is going to change anything. Um, it's not ideal that he that that he, he wins, but if he does, then it, it confirms that Donald Trump is not the problem <laughs> in Australia. The likes of Pauline Hansen and a number of other far right politicians is a confirmation that they are not the problem because a large group of people have elected to give them power, and that is the concern. That is the concern. Uh. I just want to say um, in closing how re-energized I feel talking to you all today and echo some of Nodal's points about solidarity. Like I really um, think solidarity um, building across Indigenous, uh, you know, African-American movements, First Nations movements in Canada, Palestinian movements, I really think that's how we create change. Those solidarities are so important and I really felt that here today and I just feel um, very inspired um, hearing about all your work and your writing um, and your perspectives. And I just want to thank you so much for your time today. I'll be going away today with a lot of thoughts and also a lot, even though we talked about reading lists, I've got a lot more to read as well. So <laughs> I'll be going away with like more recommendations as well. So thank you so much for that. Visit wheelercentre.com for the best in books, writing and ideas from Melbourne, Australia and the world.